Okay. Got the record going. Give it just another minute and then off we go. Okay. Just reminding everybody, we're going to get started in, in like a literal minute to mute your microphones, please, so we don't have any background noise interrupting the presentation. We will definitely allow some time at the end of the presentation for questions, so uh, so you will you will get your chance to do that. Um, if John and Grace could also mute, that would be great. If not, I'll lock it down for you. All right. <clears throat> All right, off we go. Welcome everybody to the special presentation from the Potomac River Jazz Club, uh, celebrating 50 years of bringing traditional jazz to the DC area. Um, I am personally very excited about this. I came on to the club um, you know, at a, uh, not that long ago, I think maybe about 10 years at this point. And, uh, I would, I'm really excited to know more about that early history of the club and no better person to present this, but Dave Robinson, uh, Dave is a charter member of the organization. He's the club's archivist. And, um, I mean, I, I, most of you either know him or have read his bio, and I'm not going to take up his time reading the entire thing, but um, it reads as a laundry list of, of amazing different bands, and um, both as a performer and leader, and, uh, and all kinds of uh, wonderful things he's done in, in the field of jazz music. So without further ado, to make sure we uh, get everything in, I'm going to turn it over to Dave. And for any of you, if you need to leave a little bit early, don't worry, we are recording the presentation and we will be posting it on YouTube afterwards. So everybody, here we go, Dave Robinson. Thanks, Alec. Hi, everybody, and welcome to our golden anniversary celebration of the Potomac River Jazz Club. I'm going to go ahead now and share my screen. And uh, you'll want to view this full screen so that you can see these, these graphics that I have for you. So let me do that. All right, can everybody see that? Ellie, does that look good? All right, off we go then. Um, to set the stage, I'd like to describe the DC trad jazz scene that existed prior to the PRJC first. So there was a Washington Jazz Club that formed in 1957 by Bill Riddle, drummer, and it was focused on traditional jazz. They sponsored lectures and concerts at the Charles Hotel in DC but the Washington Jazz Club dissolved after about a year. But the Charles Hotel continued as a venue for trad jazz. Pianist Booker Coleman led a group there in the early 60s that later became known as the Fulcher Harris Jazz Band, <clears throat> which held forth in the Storyville Lounge of the Charles Hotel in the mid 60s led by trumpeter Kenny Fulcher and trombonist Slide Harris. Another hot spot for trad jazz was the Bayou in Georgetown, where cornetist Wild Bill Whalen and his Dixie Six was the house band for years. This shot here is from 1960. Just up the street from the Bayou was Blues Alley, established in 1965. Originally, it was a trad jazz and swing oriented club. And it was run by clarinetist and vibist Tommy Gwaltney, whose group served as a house band and played behind many of the jazz greats from the early days. 
And then on 16th Street, there was a place called the Gaslight Club. It was a private key club where Reed man Joe Rinaldi held forth. Here's a shot of Joe in 1965. Among the trad bands that were active in the 60s was the original Washington Monumental Jazz Band, a group that played Chicago style. It was led by drummer Ken Underwood, second from the right there. We also had the New Sunshine Jazz Band. This was led by trumpeter Tony Hagert on the far left, and they specialized in lesser known rags and pop songs from the 19 teens and 20s. And then in Baltimore, we had the Bay City Seven, which formed in 1969. We also had the Docks of Dixieland. This was a group of military doctors in the late 60s that played for the patients at military hospitals. They all moonlighted as jazz musicians, led by drummer Dr. George Green. And we had the Good Time Six. This was a band specializing in classic New Orleans repertoire, led by trombonist Al Weber. Remember that name. And then we had the Shakey's Pizza Parlor scene. The Rockville Shakey's in 1968 had banjo and piano sing-alongs, which started attracting sit-ins. And this led to the formation of the first DC area Shakey's band in 1969 called the Good Timers. They played on Mondays. And then a spinoff of that group began at the Annandale Shakey's in 1970 called themselves Shakey's Dixieland Band, and they played on Tuesdays. And these groups drew big crowds. Uh, they were showy, funny, outrageous routines, both groups led by cornetist and bassist Chuck Lee Bao on the right there. And we also had as early as 1968, another pizza parlor band called Buzzy's Dixieland Band, which uh, played at Buzzy's Pizza Warehouse in Annapolis. Fridays and Saturdays, nine to midnight. And we had the Manassas Jazz Festival. This was put on by Johnson Fat Cat McCree. Remember that name too? Uh, starting in 1966 and held at the beginning of December each year in Manassas, Virginia. It featured many of the better local players plus headliners that were still active in those days like Eddie Condon, Wild Bill Davison, Maxine Sullivan, Art Hodes, Claude Hopkins, many mm -hmm. more. So all of this was in place before there was a PRJC, but it was a scattershot scene. Enter this man, Al Weber, who later wrote, it was my hunch that there would be more gigs and fun and games all around if musicians and club enthusiasts were brought together under one roof in other words, a jazz club. Al found a sympathetic ear in this man, pianist Tom Neiman, and the two of them decided to find a local watering hole to hold Sunday jam sessions with a house band and publicize them under the essentially fictitious name Potomac River Jazz Club. Tom rounded up a place called the Bratwurst House in Springfield, Virginia, and they sent out press releases and jazz broadcaster Felix Grant promoted it on his popular program on WMAL AM. And the first of these sessions was held there in November of 1970. A couple of months later, Tom moved the sessions to a more centrally located Bratwurst house in the Boston area of Arlington. And this is where things really took root. It was that month that I, age 15, opened the local paper and saw this ad. And this got my attention. I'd been collecting trad jazz records, but had never heard a live trad jazz band. I was unaware of the existing scene that I just described to you. So I pestered my parents to take me, I was too young to drive, which they did. And on January 17th, 1971, I stepped in the door of the Arlington Bratwurst House and heard this.
That's Alexandria's Ragtime Band at the Bratwurst House in Arlington. Sit-ins were welcome, but I wasn't improvising yet, so I just listened. And this was the first live trad jazz I ever heard. I brought my little portable reel-to-reel -reel recorder and made that recording that you just heard. In the band besides Al and Tom were Tony Newstead from Australia on cornet, Chuck Brown on clarinet, who later went by the name Vic Brown, Mike Pangra on bass, Doc Booker on banjo and guitar, Johnny Roulette on drums, Johnson Fat Cat McCree on vocals and kazoo. I was smitten and I would return to the Bratwurst House, but the club wasn't a club yet. It was just two guys using a name for promotional purposes. In April of 1971, at the urging of local jazz fans Anna and Fred Waller, Al and Tom decided to take the plunge and make the PRJC a real club. To do this required some seed money for postage and printing, so Al and Tom and three of their friends each contributed $50 to launch the club. And these five initial investors are known today as the founding fathers of the PRJC. Trombonist Al Weber, pianist Tom Neiman, vocalist and kazooist Johnson McCree, trombonist Hal Farmer, and George Mercer, who played washboard and had been the host of Jazz Anthology on WAMU-FM since 1965. Here they are, all hail the founding fathers. <laughs> they started recruiting members and drawing modest dues or charging modest dues, and the Potomac River Jazz Club was born with the Arlington Bratwurst House as its home base. Tom Neiman was president, no vice president, Al Weber secretary, Hal Farmer treasurer, and an initial board consisting of drummer Ozzy Barr, Shannon and Jermaine Clark, trumpeter Tony Hager, cornetist Dan Priest, Anna and Fred Waller, and pianist Gary Wilkinson, who was member number eight of the PRJC and is still a member today. The club wasted no time in inaugurating a more or less quarterly newsletter, Tailgate Ramblings, whose covers featured Tom Neiman's cartoons. In the first Tailgate Ramblings, May of 1971, editor Al Weber lamented that 500 invitations mailed and handed out had resulted in only 50 paid memberships a month later. But he vowed in print that whether or not we enlist another member, the show will continue to go on. To which President Neiman added, there is no end to the things we can do. And their enthusiasm carried the day. As soon as I got wind that the club was accepting members, I joined. I was member number 85 in July of 71. And when you joined, you got this membership card and this certificate <laughs> featuring Tom, Tom Neiman's cartoon characters. The second edition of Tailgate Ramblings in, in August of 71 noted a doubling of the membership to 100. And that edition of the newsletter featured a PRJC member's first-hand account of hearing Bix and the Wolverines play their very first gig at a roadhouse in Ohio, and later being coached by Bix and even carrying Bix's horn into the Jeanette Studios for his first recording session. Well, you don't see articles like that anymore. <laughs> the club's first shindig was a jazz picnic in September of 71 at a German beer garden in Jessup, Maryland, called Blobs Park. Four hours, three bands, and look at the deal here. Old style German buffet, all the beer you can drink, four hours of jazz by three different bands, 
four dollars and fifty cents <laughs> for club members. Well, two hundred people showed up. Uh, that's Anna Waller on the left there at the very first PRJC picnic. Eleanor Johnson on the right. I'm not sure who that is in the center, but uh, the first picnic was a great success and it became the club's flagship event for decades. And following that success, the club began producing concerts featuring local bands at the American Legion Hall in College Park, followed by bashes at Glen Echo Park and on a CNO canal boat. The club was growing and new friendships were forming. And the PRJC was a very social organization and members started traveling to festivals together out of the area and they called themselves TJF's traveling jazz fans. And you could always find a PRJC contingent of TJF's at festivals in St. Louis, New Orleans, Davenport, all over the place. Here's, here's one of those traveling contingents. The man on the right behind the parasol is Shannon Clark, who in 1972 became the club's second president with Anna Waller as vice president. Notice the parasol there. <clears throat> that parasol belonged to Anna Waller. There she is surrounded by some of her PRJC friends holding the parasol. I think, I, I assume that she made it herself, but I'm not certain. Uh, but this parasol design became iconic for the PRJC. It was used as an early logo. And um, here's a good look at the parasol. And the parasol soon found its way onto buttons that were widely sported by club members. I'm wearing one here today, uh, as well as decals that could be seen on car windows and instrument cases. And the club also printed up bumper stickers that uh, were not an uncommon sight on the beltway. By the way, the parasol logo a few years later found its way onto a special birthday cake for Fred Waller. Here's Fred with Doris Baker and Fred is sporting the parasol button and it's pretty hip, don't you think, to have a matching button and birthday cake. <laughs> the second annual jazz picnic was held in September 72 at Blobs Park. Here's a shot of that. Um, that's Anna in the middle there in the hat. <clears throat> and this time it was expanded from four hours to eight hours, from three bands to 11 bands and 400 people came out. Playing that day were the Bay City Seven, the Dixie Five O, a, a group which combined trad jazz with Hawaiian music. Shakey's Dixieland Band, the Anacostia River Ramblers, the Bull Run Blues Blowers, the original Washington Monumental Jazz Band, the Good Time Six, the New Sunshine Jazz Band, Capital City Jazz Band, Alexandria's Ragtime Band, and Kid Bastion's Camellia Jazz Band from Toronto. Here's some happy picnickers that day. I'm not sure who's on the far left, but uh, you see Anna Waller there, Charlotte St. Germain, and Shannon Clark on the right at the second picnic. And there's Anna signing up a new member that day. <laughs> so let's go to Blobs Park, the PRJC Jazz Picnic in September of 1972, and listen to a little bit of the original Washington Monumental Jazz Band. Thank you. 
a little taste of the PRJC Jazz Picnic from 1972. You see that uh, reel-to-reel -reel recorder in the foreground there? That's the tape we just heard, uh, recorded by Hal Farmer, one of our founding fathers. In 1972, the club began putting out a mini newsletter called, Hey, What's the PRJC Doing Now? And this was mailed out every other week in between tailgate ramblings to keep on top of the gig scene. Uh, it was put out by Polly Wagner, sort of a predecessor to today's periodic email blasts that Debbie Lou puts out. And look, a PRJC concert at Blues Alley says there. This this uh, mini newsletter came out for. Okay, thanks a lot. All right, we need everybody on mute, please. Thank you. <laughs> Here's a PRJC coup. In September of 1972, PRJC presented famed cornetist Wild Bill Davison and stride pianist Claude Hopkins at the Bratwurst House. And here's a shot of that occasion. There's Wild Bill, Claude Hopkins at the piano. In November of 72, the club incorporated as a 501c3 nonprofit organization. There's a shot of the uh, articles of incorporation. And those articles include this mission statement, which is unchanged to this day, to develop and promote through demonstrations, concerts, lectures, publications, and otherwise, appreciation of traditional American jazz music, and to educate its members and the general public in this type of music, fostering its preservation and continuation. By the way, uh, board meetings in those days were reportedly pretty lively affairs. I remember hearing tales of a fist fight at one board meeting. That was before I went on the board, but opinions were deeply held in those days. <laughs> in February of 73, the club began a series at the Windjammer Room of the Marriott Twin Bridges Hotel, which is now long gone. Uh, this was every Sunday night. It was a rotation of local and touring bands presented by the club and this became a new home for the PRJC for several years. Here's Max Colley's Rhythm Aces from the UK playing at the Windjammer Room for the club in 1973. By 1973, the club was putting on monthly specials now featuring bands from out of the area like the Bix Beiderbeck Memorial Jazz Band from New Jersey Gene Mail's Dixieland Rhythm Kings from Ohio, the New Black Eagle Jazz Band from Massachusetts, and touring international bands. These monthly concerts were held in hotel ballrooms from 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. That remained the time slot for many years, 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. In 1973, the club did its first jazz boat ride on the Potomac on the Diplomat and 300 people showed up on the boat for that. Here's a look at Shakey's Dixieland Band in Annandale before Chuck Liebau moved away in 1973. Trombonist Al Brogdon on the far left there um, assumed leadership of the band when Chuck moved away and the band called itself Southern Comfort and we'll be hearing from them later. Okay, why are we looking at a picture of a statue? Well, because the PRJC helped put it there. In 1973, PRJC made a contribution to the Louis Armstrong Statue Fund and helped to erect this statue of Louis in New Orleans, which is there to this day. Tailgate Ramblings in fall of 73 had an article by pianist Ed Fischel encouraging the use of the term trad jazz and the avoidance of the term Dixieland. Well, Ed was ahead of his time. This is uh, a, a cause that's been uh, dear to my heart for years. 
And the, the D word, as I call it, is popping up quite a bit in this presentation because it was in common usage decades ago. And so it's unavoidable in this historical context. But today, most people prefer to call it trad jazz. And um, Ed Fischel was uh, prescient here. <laughs> In 1973, in December, the club held its first annual meeting. This was free to members. And uh, it was a brief business meeting and then a report from the president, followed by open floor discussion, and then jazz for the rest of the night. Free to members. This became an annual event. In 1974, Tailgate Ramblings became a monthly under its new editor, Dick Baker. And in that year, uh, the PRJC presented a lecture series by jazz critic and writer Martin Williams of the Smithsonian at the Marriott Twin Bridges. So we were doing educational presentations early on. Here's Ed Fischel. Um, Ed ran the jam sessions, and in 1974, the jam sessions were being held at the Cinders Steakhouse in Arlington. And uh, I used to sit in at the Cinders and dip, dip my toe into playing this music with encouragement from Ed. In 1974, the club had its second annual boat ride on the Potomac. and held its fourth annual jazz picnic. Here's the membership table at the jazz picnic. That looks like Al Weber standing there at the table, if I'm not mistaken. And here's the 74 picnic in, pull, in full swing. Goodly crowd was there. Here's the happy crowd enjoying the free beer and jazz. And after the scheduled bands were done, musicians would jam into the night. That year, a cassette was issued of the Jazz Picnic and another one two years later in 76. Uh, the club didn't issue one in 75. I guess the 74s hadn't sold out yet. <laughs> Here's the traditional jazz band of Sao Paulo, Brazil playing for the club in 1975. And that was the year that there was an event held in Indianapolis called the World Championship of Jazz. This was a trad festival with an amazing lineup, uh, but it was presented as a competition. And jazz societies were invited to sponsor a band of their choosing uh, the performances would be judged by a panel of experts and the audience, and the sponsor of the top winner was to receive $3,000. I don't know if you can read uh, the lineup here, but it's an amazing lineup. The Jim Cullum Jazz Band, the original Salty Dogs, Wild Bill Davison All-Stars, Gene Mail's Dixieland Rhythm Kings, the Turk Murphy Jazz Band, Max Colley's Rhythm Aces, New Black Eagle Jazz Band, the Climax Jazz Band, all in one festival. I mean, wow. And the competition was held, and the winner was Max Colley's Rhythm Aces from the UK. And guess who sponsored them? <laughs> the Potomac River Jazz Club. But the event was a great success artistically, but not financially. The event lost $43,000 and the winning sponsors never got their prize money and many of the musicians didn't get paid. So that was the end of the world championship of jazz, but we sponsored the winner. <laughs> 1975 was also the year that Southern Comfort took up residence at the Shakey's in Rockville, um, the beginning of a long run. And for many years, Shakey's in Rockville was the place to be on Friday nights. In 1976, 
uh, the club formed the National Museum of Traditional Jazz. This was PRJC's bicentennial project, recognized by the federal government as official bicentennial activity number 19455. Uh, it was set up as a separate nonprofit organization, but formed with seed money from the PRJC to tell the story of trad jazz as part of the National Bicentennial Celebration. Rod Clark was the spearhead of that initiative. The museum took the form of an ambitious exhibit at the Martin Luther King Public Library in DC. It was a series of wall panels with photos, texts, posters, and memorabilia combined with four 20 minute audiovisual segments consisting of recorded music and narration synchronized with slideshows on rear view projection screens. This was pretty high tech for 1976. Oops, I keep losing my cursor, okay. There was a dedication ceremony held in the library in August of 76, attended by civic leaders and the media. And what was intended to be a two month exhibit proved so popular, it ran until January of 78 a year and a half, after which the museum donated its accumulated holdings of books, magazines, and sheet music to the Martin Luther King Library as the Gordon Gullickson Collection. In 1976, fresh out of college, I formed the Storyville Seven with Ed Fischel's help. Uh, this was a band assembled at random from Ed's list of available guys who had been playing at the jam sessions. We got together, rehearsed, and then took the Tuesday night slot at the Bratwurst House, every Tuesday night, 8.30 to 11.30, for which we earned the princely sum of $6 a piece, plus free beer and sausage snacks. <laughs> and we did this for over four years. And uh, that was my apprenticeship into this music. 1976 also saw the formation of the Federal Jazz Commission led by Al Weber on the far left there. They played the Monday slot at the Bratwurst House and the Bratwurst House was now featuring ja trad jazz almost nightly. Um, the Federal Jazz Commission was a band that would undergo various personnel changes over the years, but it was one of the most popular bands in the club. Here's the view from the bandstand looking at the interior of the Bratwurst House. It wasn't always this well attended, <laughs> but um, this night there's a goodly crowd and I see in this photo, I, I can see Eleanor Johnson, Dick and Doris Baker, Royal and Erica Stokes, and Ken and Blossom Kramer. Speaking of Dick Baker, in May of 77, uh, the PRJC debuted its own radio program called the Jazz Band Ball on the then, the then new WPFW FM station, 6 o'clock to 7.30 p.m. every Sunday night. And many of us record collectors in the club took turns hosting the show. It ran for about 12 years. And here's Dick at the console. Uh, let's tune our dials to 89.3 FM and see what Dick is up to here. and welcome to the Jazz Band Ball, a weekly program of traditional jazz and ragtime music brought to you each Sunday at 6.30 by the Potomac River Jazz Club. My name is Dick Baker, your host for the next hour and a half in a show devoted to the traditional jazz bands of East Europe. Uh, some of you who have, are regular listeners know that I made a trip to that part of the world a couple of years ago, brought back a lot of records and have had some sent to me since. We've done shows on Soviet jazz bands, shows on the jazz bands of Poland and uh, Czechoslovakia. And I just got another bunch of records. We have uh, four different bands from Prague, which 
I think, qualifies as the traditional jazz capital of Eastern Europe, and one band each from Leningrad and from Jena, a town in East Germany. We'll start off with a uh, tune by the Classic Jazz Collegium of Prague. The tune is Sunday. <laughs> little taste of the jazz band ball radio program there. And that year, 1977, the club also presented uh, the Hallelujah Ramblers from Germany, as well as the Jazz Miners, a teenage band from Oregon that burst on the scene that year and did a national tour. They were a powerhouse show band. Uh, the Wallers took them under their wing and got them an additional gig in this area at the White House, <laughs> which is where Anna worked. And, um, and they, were, they put on quite a show. And speaking of powerhouse bands and the Wallers, one month later, jazz picnic director Fred Waller had to fill an empty slot in the lineup for the 1977 picnic. So he put together a pickup group of local players and they rehearsed in the Wallers basement and the group clicked so well with each other and with the picnic audience that they stuck together. And under the co-leadership of cornetist Jim Ritter and trombonist Frank Messick, they became one of the most popular bands on the National Trad Jazz Festival circuit, the Buck Creek Jazz Band. Here they are playing the following year at the 78 Jazz Picnic. Now they're in matching shirts <laughs> and um, a phenomenally successful group, and we'll hear from them a little bit later. In 1979, the PRJC co-sponsored a fate of beloved local jazz broadcaster Felix Grant at the National Press Club. And uh, there was also a reception held for him at the Kennedy Center, at which the PRJC presented him with a plaque on stage. Felix was a big booster of the club on his program on WMAL AM. In 79, the boat ride moved to the Severn River, sailing out of Annapolis now on the Harbor Queen, and that would remain a popular event for many more years. Also that year, the club began a series uh, of two band specials called Contrasts in Style, just uh, presenting two local bands with, with different stylistic approaches. And that became a series. 1979 saw the beginning of another annual tradition, the Buck Creek Crab Feast held in the Waller's backyard. All the crabs you could eat and music by the Buck Creek Jazz Band. This was not a, officially a PRJC event at first, but it was attended by lots of fans from the PRJC. Uh, this is a shot of the Buck Creek Crab Feast a few years later. In 1979, the Turk Murphy Jazz Band from San Francisco with vocalist Pat Yankee played for the PRJC at Tyson's Corner, and that was quite a get for us. Here's a shot of that occasion, Turk and, and uh, Pat Yankee at the mic there. 1980 saw the beginning of another annual flagship event for the club, the Jazz Jubilee for Charity, originally called the Jazzathon. And this was a sort of indoors version of the jazz picnic. It was held in the winter with all profits being donated to a charity. Originally, it was for the Easter Seals. Uh, later, uh, it benefited the Alzheimer's Association, the Leukemia Society, and various others. And uh, Felix Grant emceed this first one. By this time, 1980, the club's membership had grown to well over a thousand. Uh, notice the Tom Neiman cartoon there on our uh, membership flyer, which had become a PRJC logo. Uh, this became known 
affectionately or not so affectionately in later years as the Funny Little Men logo. <laughs> And the Jazz Picnic had picked up even more steam. The 1980 Jazz Picnic had 18 groups, nine and a half hours of music, and still, still free beer and a jazz flea market. In 1980, the Sunshine Skiffle Band was formed, a group that patterned itself after the jug bands of the 1920s. And also in 1980, the PRJC formed the PRJC Brass Band. Uh, it was put together by Beale Riddle. Uh, he's on the bass drum there in that photo. And this was put together as a promotional unit for the club. It was modeled after the second line brass bands in New Orleans um, and played in parades and such. Let me, uh, if I can get my cursor, hello. Okay, we'll let you hear a little bit of that. That's a little taste of the PRJC Brass Band. Uh, the band played for parades indoors and outdoors for many years. And, uh, and the band won many parade awards over the years. Here's some of those. Also in 1980, two very popular new venues popped up. The Buck Creek Jazz Band began a long run at the Springfield Hilton on the Sunday nights and a cozy little neighborhood pub in Northeast DC called Colonel Brooks Tavern began featuring jazz. There's Colonel Brooks Tavern, a favorite PRJC hangout, now long gone. The Sheiks of Dixie played there initially led by banjoist and pianist Dave Littlefield. And then the Federal Jazz Commission took up residence at Colonel Brooks beginning in 1981. And this would be their home for a 27 year run. Let's check out the feds from a jazz festival a few years later. Here's the Federal Jazz Commission Got to place the cursor for this one. There we go. bit of the Federal Jazz Commission there. Well, January 16th, 1981 marked the end of an era. The Bratwurst House burned. On this night, someone dumped cigarette ashes into a trash can and in the middle of the night it ignited and by morning the Bratwurst House was no more. The action moved for a while to another spot in Arlington called Johnny Lang's 
I remember the proprietors of the Bratwurst House, Nick and Betty Nikolic, showed up at Johnny Lang's after losing their restaurant to cheer on the bands that they missed hearing. In 1981, the Last Chance Jazz Band was formed by Reed man Bob Thulman, and their home base was a place called the Last Chance Saloon in Columbia, Maryland. In 1981, I started up PRJC record sales as a fundraising project for the club. Al Weber had offered discounts on select record labels in the early years as an enticement to join, uh, but that was done by mail order. I convinced the club to invest in an initial inventory of records that we could sell on the spot at our monthly events with the club getting the profit margin. And my friend Sonny McGowan helped me for many years with that project. Here's a shot of me and my wife Judy manning the record sales table with Al Weber and Dave Littlefield examining the wares. <laughs> I still run this operation for the club and uh, mostly with donated records and CDs now. And since 1981, it has raised almost $30,000 for the club. In 1982, the Pontchartrain Causeway New Orleans Jazz Band was formed. This was a New Orleans revival style band led by drummer Dick Stimson with Al Weber there on trombone and yours truly on the trumpet with the Federal Jazz Commission at Colonel Brooks in the 1980s for a while. In 1982, the club presented the Old School Band from Switzerland. In 1984, I produced a double sampler LP for the club featuring 21 PRJC affiliated bands. Bunny Wagner did the drawing there, the silhouette drawing and that became our new logo and is still in use today as a logo for the club. That's where it originated on the cover of that LP. In 1984, the PRGC presented the Hot Antic Jazz Band from France, a terrific group. And this turned out to be an especially memorable concert because the band brought an unannounced guest Jabbo Smith, <laughs> trumpet star of the 1920s, who sang with the band on this occasion, and that was really a special treat. None of us knew he was going to be there. Uh, years earlier in 1978, PRJC had supported the formation of a Federated Jazz Society of America, which didn't get off the ground, but a successor initiative did in 1985. Uh, the American Federation of Jazz Societies was formed. And this was a pre-internet initiative to get the country's jazz societies, both traditional and modern, in touch with each other and sharing best practices. PRJC was instrumental in bringing that about, logistically and financially. The club contributed $1,000 to get that started. Harold Gray and I were the club's emissaries to that organization, which accomplished much over the course of several decades. Harold was a tireless worker for the club and for jazz in general up into his 90s, and he lived to the age of 101. In 1985, we had the Elotria Jazz Band from Germany, and that was a dynamite show. And in July of that year, the club helped sponsor the Young Tuxedo Brass Band from New Orleans to come play in the Smithsonian's Folklife Festival on the Mall. And as a thank you, the band played for the club at Colonel Brooks and invited a bunch of us local players to sit in. And that was one heck of a night. In 1985, I was, that was the year I was president and my big project for the club was the Morton Centennial Celebration. Uh, Jelly Roll Morton's birth date had always been given as September 20th, 1885. And I figured we should celebrate the centennial of that in a big way. 
But after we set our plans in motion, we learned of new research that put his birth date at 1890. <laughs> but we were too far along to quit and wait five years. So we went ahead and we staged a big public ceremony in DC on Jelly Roll's birthday at the site of his old nightclub in the late 1930s called the Music Box, 1211 U Street Northwest. Uh, this was in collaboration with the Lincoln Theater Corporation which at that time owned the building and was restoring the adjacent Lincoln Theater. In this photo uh, of, of the celebration, you can see Martin Williams and Johnson McCree in front of the Van Windshield there. The celebration included a specially assembled jazz band, including Morton expert Jim Topogny on piano and drummer Dude Brown. You can see him at the far left there who had played with Jelly Roll at the Music Box. And we had a dance troupe and uh, I brought in Alan Lomax to speak. Uh, he was the renowned folklorist who had made the famous acetate recordings of Jelly Roll's reminiscences at the Library of Congress in 1938. And the mayor issued a proclamation there it is, whereas, 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 I do hereby proclaim this day Ferdinand Jelly Roll Morton Day in DC and call upon all the residents of this great city to join with me in celebrating the memory of this musical giant. And we had a plaque made for the building, for the, for the music box building where Jelly Roll had his club. Here's the text of the plaque, which uh, somehow never made it onto the building. Uh, <laughs> The installation of the plaque was not under the PRJC's purview, and I'm not sure what became of it, but it never got onto the building. Anyway, the event was featured on the news that night, and, um, and that month we also produced the Morton Marathon broadcast on WPFW. This was the first ever airing of every existing recording of Morton, including the complete Library of Congress sessions, dirty lyrics and all, <laughs> 25 hours of recordings. That year, the club was named a finalist for the Mayor's Arts Award in the category Excellence in Service to the Arts. We didn't win, but we were honored to be in some pretty fast company there. In March of 86, the American Federation of Jazz Societies held its first annual convention in DC, an event produced by the PRJC. Here you see President Reagan's greeting to the national delegates. And the speakers included Martin Williams of the Smithsonian and Willis Conover of the Voice of America. And there was a jam session for that event, which included trombonist Spiegel Wilcox who had recorded with Bix Beiderbecke in the Gene Goldkett Orchestra. Here's a flyer for the Chicago Rhythm Kings from 1980, or Chicago, just Chicago Rhythm, they called themselves, from 1987, including a young Vince Giordano. And this was the year the PRJC membership reached its peak, 1987. 1,800 members, a few of which are enjoying themselves here in this picture. Uh, that's Don Angel in the center there. Uh, just a remarkable growth over a period of 16 years. In the fall of 87, Southern Comfort moved from the Rockville Shakies, which had been remodeled and no longer accommodated music, to the Fairfax Shakies, and they continued to hold forth there for a while. <clears throat> Let's listen to a little bit of Southern Comfort. Whoops. <laughs>
have Southern comfort. In the fall of 87, the Buck Creek Band held a 10th anniversary mini fest. This was the first of several mini fests produced by the Wallers at the Buck Creek's home base, the Springfield Hilton. And um, at this first one, they were joined by the New Black Eagles from Massachusetts, the Hot Cotton Jazz Band from Nashville, and the High Sierra Jazz Band from California. Here's Fred and Anna dancing to the Buck Creek Jazz Band. Tell you what, let's all dance to the Buck Creek Jazz Band. This is from 1987. The Buck Creek, 1987. Here's a flyer for the 1988 Jazz Picnic. And look at this, 11 and a half hours and still free beer. <laughs> In 1988, the Federal Focus Jazz Band was formed. It was and still is a band of high school and college students under my direction formed by businessman Jim Tozy, who is on our call here today, under the sponsorship of an organization in DC called Federal Focus Incorporated. And PRJC helped with publicity and supplemental funding. And the band initially played for many dignitaries at government agency functions, gigs at the White House, the Capitol, Blair House, the Vice President's residence, and so on. In the early 90s, a number of PRJC bands played at Jacques Cafe in Arlington. Here's the Federal Focus Jazz Band at Jacques Cafe. Uh, the Sunshine Skiffle Band played there too, and uh, as well as the Not So Modern Jazz Quartet and others. In 1991, Reed man Jack Moser and banjoist Chris Harris formed the new traditional jazz band with Jack's baritone sax instead of trombone and featuring Jack's interesting arrangement of tunes not often heard. Let's uh, check out a little bit of them. That was the new traditional jazz band, a very young Dave Jellema there on cornet. In 1991, the club produced its first jazz barbecue. This was like a second jazz picnic uh, held on the grounds of a place in Upper, Mar Upper Marlboro called the German Orphan's Home. And this was held annually for a few years. Highlights of 1992 included the Louisiana Repertory Jazz Ensemble from New Orleans 
and the original Salty Dogs from Chicago, one of the most popular bands in the country. In 1993, the PRJC toyed with the idea of producing a full-scale trad jazz festival. Uh, a business plan was drafted, showing a budget of around $50,000. It never quite came to fruition, but almost. And in 1994, the club produced a cassette sampler of the club's affiliated bands. This was a promo issue, not for sale. It was just given out to prospective clients to help our local bands get hired. The jam sessions continued through the years. Uh, hosting jam sessions has always been an important part of the club's mission. In the 1980s, they were held at Puff's Restaurant in Oakton, Virginia. And then in 91, at the S&W Cafeteria in Falls Church. Uh, by 94, they were being held at the Rockville Elks. Uh, using a rotation of host bands. And the Rockville Elks became a venue for the club's monthly concerts as well. And then in 1995, the jam sessions were moved to the Calvert House Inn in Riverdale, Maryland, uh, which became another long-term home of the PRJC. Uh, and these jams were still hosted by a rotation of PRJC bands. In 1996, the Jazz Picnic was rechristened the Jazz Fest. Uh, it was called that for a few years, but the name didn't stick. Everybody still called it the Jazz Picnic. So. <laughs> uh, and this, 1996, this was the last year for the free beer. <laughs> in 1997, the club was using Rosenstiel Hall in Silver Spring as a venue for our monthly concerts. We were still also using the Rockville Elks, but we alternated for a while be before settling on Rosensteel as our home. And here's a, a recent look at Rosensteel Hall. One of the first concerts at Rosensteel Hall in 1997 was a special concert pairing two French Sidney Bechet disciples, the famous Claude Luther who played and recorded extensively but with Bechet in the 1950s, and Jacques Gautet, who had emigrated to New Orleans and was a, a beloved musician down there. Two of them got together and put on a wonderful show for us. Speaking of France, the following month, the Federal Focus was selected to compete in the Louis Armstrong International Jazz Competition in France where they placed ahead of several of the adult bands and were, they were awarded a special judge's prize. Uh, let's listen to a little bit of that prize winning performance. Federal Focus Jazz Band in France. Well, the band's prize was six bottles of fine French champagne, which of course the band was too young to drink. <laughs> so we brought the bottles home and we raffled them off. Uh, later that year, the PRJC took ownership of the Federal Focus Jazz Band. Jim Tozzi had been sponsoring it for, for a number of years. And um, in 97, he signed over the band to the club but generously continued to provide some funding. And with that, the Focus Jazz Band, as it was called at the time, became the official youth learning program of the Potomac River Jazz Club. 
1999, the PRJC sponsored a 12 concert early American jazz series at two public parks in Virginia. And this was repeated for a few subsequent summers. Also that year, the PRJC organized a trip to New Orleans, accompanying the Federal Focus Band for its slot to play in the French Quarter Festival. And here's the tour group at the Armstrong statue that the club helped to erect years earlier. The band also played for the tour group at Preservation Hall and elsewhere around town. And it was so much fun that we did it again in 2000. There's the tour group and the band in 2000. Here's the Federal Focus Jazz Band parading in the rain in 2000 in New Orleans. After this year, the band took other travel opportunities, but the club continued its annual group tours to the French Quarter uh, for the French Quarter Festival. And these were organized by Rachel Erickson and it became an annual tradition for many years. You can just see Rachel a little bit on the far right there. <laughs> in 2001, the club produced a new Bands of the Potomac River Jazz Club sampler for its 30th anniversary, this time a CD featuring 16 bands. And this was produced by Rachel Erickson and Don Farwell. In 2002, the PRJC organized a trip to England and Scotland, accompanying the Federal Focus Jazz Band for its slot to play in the Whitley Bay Jazz Festival in Newcastle. And the band also played for the tour group at the famous 100 Club in London. That's what you see there. That year, the club presented a concert featuring New Orleans trumpet star, Duke Heitker. Two thousand three saw the birth of a new band. This one was a collaboration between the PRJC and the Washington Conservatory of Music, and it resulted in the Washington Conservatory of Music Traditional Jazz Ensemble, led by drummer Howard Cadison and trombonist David Sager, who taught at the Washington Conservatory. And this was a band that was formed to do some educational and promotional performances. In 2003, the PRJC took over the production of the Buck Creek Crab Feast, and that would continue for a few more years. In 2004, the Federal Focus Jazz Band changed its name at the request of the Federal Jazz Commission. Two bands with the name Federal was generating some confusion. So the Federal Jazz Commission played a benefit concert for the Federal Focus Jazz Band. Here's the two bands jamming together at that concert. And during the concert, the Federal Focus ceremoniously changed its name to the Capital Focus Jazz Band. And here I am handing over the word federal to Marty Frankel, leader of the Federal Jazz Commission. And that year, the club organized a trip to the Netherlands, accompanying now the Capital Focus Jazz Band for its slot to play in the famous North Sea Jazz Festival. Here's the tour group at a windmill. And here's the band playing at the North Sea Festival that's in The Hague. Also that year, the club presented New Orleans-based vocalist Banu Gibson with an all-star band of mostly New York players. And Banu will be performing for us again with a New Orleans contingent live streamed on May 15th. So you'll wanna catch that. In November, 2004, the Washington Conservatory group became the permanent host band for the jam sessions, which were still being held at the Calvert House Inn. A highlight of the following year was another all-star group led by pianist Jeff Barnhart, featuring New York cornetist John Eric Kelso. And 2005 was also the year of the horrible destruction in New Orleans due to Hurricane Katrina. 
So in October of that year, the club and the Washington Conservatory of Music jointly held a benefit concert for out of work New Orleans musicians featuring the Washington Conservatory traditional jazz ensemble. And this raised some money to send to the Musicians Relief Fund in New Orleans. In February of 2006, the jam sessions moved to Normandy Farm Restaurant in Potomac, where they're still being held today and still being hosted by the, uh, the Washington Conservatory Group. And 2006 was the year of the last Jazz Jubilee, a 27 year run for that event, which raised a lot of money for charity over the years. <clears throat> in 2008, the club presented a jug band bash featuring three groups playing in the skiffle style. And that year, the club organized a trip to Switzerland accompanying the Capital Focus Band for its slot to play in the Ascona New Orleans Festival. And there's the band playing for a goodly crowd in Switzerland. Later that year, the club brought down my brother from New York, the famous Scott Robinson, and paired us up for a concert billed as the Robinson Brothers Orchestra. And that was a lot of fun. In 2011, the club organized a trip to Spain, accompanying Capital Focus for a series of concerts in Madrid and Barcelona. This shot was taken in, uh, in uh, let's see, Madrid. No, I'm sorry, Barcelona. <laughs> also in 2011, the club's partnership with Washington Conservatory of Music expired and I assumed leadership of the group and we kept going as the Conservatory Classic Jazz Band, uh, no longer as associated with Washington Conservatory, but we just kept conservatory in the name for continuity. And the band continued to host the jam sessions at Normandy Farm and still does today. Here's a flyer that gives us a look at what was happening in 2012. Um, Concerts by Howl's Bayou Jazz Band, Ben Mauger's Vintage Jazz Band from Pennsylvania, the Swing Time Big Band, David Sager's Rhythm Maniacs, Dixieland Direct, Glenn Kreitzer and Mashia Lake, the Jazz Picnic, of course, Peabody Ragtime Ensemble, the Annual Membership Meeting, and the Swing Shift Big Band. Also in 2012, the club launched a successful campaign to get the Capital Focus Jazz Band on the Jazz Fest at Sea Caribbean Cruise with uh, club members accompanying. And here's a shot of the band on the ship. In 2013, the club presented the great British stride and boogie pianist Neville Dickey in concert with the Conservatory Classic Jazz Band at Calvary Lutheran Church in Silver Spring. And this became an annual tradition. In 2014, PRJC took another trip to New Orleans, accompanying Capital Focus, this time not for the French Quarter Festival, but for the Satchmo Summerfest. In 2015, Blobs Park was sold to developers and the last two jazz picnics were held at the Workhouse Arts Center in Lorton, Virginia in 2015 and 2016. In 2018, New Orleans pianist John Royan played for the club with uh, David Sager's Pie in the Sky Band. And things were humming along nicely and then a pandemic happened. <laughs> uh, before it hit in March of 2020, the PRJC was continuing to present monthly concerts at Rosensteel Hall. And here's a look at the recurring trad jazz gigs that were happening in this area pre-pandemic. Um, there was quite a bit of activity going on in the trad jazz world still, but it all came to a screeching halt, except 
that the club successfully pivoted to live streamed shows broadcast from Calvary Lutheran Church. Uh, these are live musicians playing to an empty house broadcast over the internet, such as this show by Halley's Hot Gumbo Swing Tet, which included three Capital Focus alumni. And just a few days ago, ago the club presented a live stream by Orleans Express. And the club is continuing to sponsor live audience jam sessions held outdoors for now, as weather permits, hosted by the Conservatory Classic Jazz Band at our home of 15 years, Normandy Farm Restaurant in Potomac. We'll be there this coming Sunday, April 18th, 2.30 to 4.30. Come join us, uh, weather permitting. Here's a little bit of the Conservatory Classic Jazz Band at Normandy Farms. In addition to the live stream concerts, Eli Casa has curated an educational lecture series during the pandemic. Um, she's presented webinars by Dr. Michael White of New Orleans, Dr. John Hassey of the Smithsonian, Ricky Riccardi of the Louis Armstrong House and Museum, and other distinguished experts in traditional jazz. The recorded videos of these webinars and live streamed concerts can be viewed anytime on the club's YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and type in Potomac River Jazz Club. And the club has a Facebook page as well with lots of cool stuff posted there. And a website, of course, prjc.org. There's so many popular bands I haven't been able to mention today. Big Bertha's Rhythm Kings, Brooks Tegler's Hot Jazz. My apologies to the many PRJC bands that I have not been able to get to today. I want to give thanks to my fellow past presidents of the PRJC who have steered the ship over half a century. Here's the honor roll. Some of these fine people are no longer alive, but we remember them with gratitude. Tom Neiman, Shannon Clark, Fred Waller, Ed Fischel, Eleanor Johnson, Harold Gray, Dick Baker, Ray West, Mary Doyle, Ken Kramer, Gary Wilkinson, Roy Hostetter, Don Farwell, Jerry Atticott, Al Brogdon, Mari Cagle, Frank Burke, Rod Jellema, Rachel Erickson, Tom Pockler, Wilda Von Stein, Audrey Van Dyke, Chuck Enland, Tim O'Nash, and our long-serving current president, Barry Kelly. I want to thank other movers and shakers who served the club in some capacity. I can't name them all, but Bill Sterling, Helen Carraway, Carol Palmer, Stu Parcher, Joe Godfrey, Bill Meisel, Gene Hyden, Ann Dethridge, Don Angel, Jim Lyons, Royal Stokes, Charlie Bitterly, Amber Middleman, Dave Singer, Lois Stewart, Jim Nielsen, John Gable, Evelyn Franklin, Bill Rowe, Gail Morfitt, Nancy Fox, Don Rouse, and so many more. And finally, let's raise a glass to the people who are in this photo. These folks have been meeting via Zoom every other week to keep the music happening during this pandemic and to lay plans for our 50th anniversary celebrations. A big virtual round of applause to President Barry Kelly, 
Vice President Tim O'Nash, Secretary Bill McFadden, Treasurer Bob Liu, Tailgate Ramblings Editor Ellie Casa, Webmaster Debbie Liu, Membership Secretary Judy Robinson, Publicity Chair Lois Beaver, as well as Joel Albert, John Ayers, Les Elkins, Chuck Enland, Bunny Roncevic, John Stewart, and Don White. These hardworking folks are planning a multi-band 50th anniversary bash for September 12th, hopefully in person if conditions allow. So mark that date. Also keep an eye out for availability of some hip apparel soon to be ordered commemorating the club's 50th. Here's a look at some of the shirts the club has offered in the past. And if you are not a member of the PRJC, you should be, please join us. Go to prjc.org. And if you have any historical materials that you would consider donating to the club's archive, like photos, flyers, minutes of board meetings, uh, or records, CDs, books for our record sales operation, please contact me. Uh, you can go to prjc.org, click on about, and you can email me from there. So there you have it, folks, 50 years of the Potomac River Jazz Club. And with that, I'm going to come out of screen sharing and I'll take your questions and comments, starting with two people that I hope are still with us here that I'd like to say a brief word. Let me get out of screen sharing. Okay. And let's see, do we have Vic? Vic, are you there? Vic is not there, okay. I was hoping we would have uh, Vic Brown, who was the clarinetist in that first PRJC band. Um, he's, uh, he's still playing, he lives in Williamsburg now. There are two, there are two people on by phone um, who, uh, one of them could be Vic, and uh, Vic, if you can hear me, um, we uh, uh, you would want to unmute, but I don't know how to do that by way of phone. So maybe you could go to the second one, and I'll just look up how to unmute by phone, just in case that's the issue. Uh, while we're waiting to see if Vic comes on, how about Jenny? Do we have Jenny? Yes. Where, where is Jenny? Well, uh, hi. Hi, David and everyone. Hi, Jenny. Are you by phone or can we see you? Can, I can see you. Can you see me? I'm, no. Yeah, I'm, I'm videoed. Yeah. So uh, this is so impressive to see all this and there how you you've There's carried you. on the tradition all these years. It's wonderful. Um, my dad would be delighted. Yeah, uh, folks, I didn't, Jenny, I didn't say who you are. This is Jenny Weber, who is the daughter of the founder of PRJC, Al Weber. Who, yeah. Uh, who yeah. passed and away 10 years ago yesterday, right? Yes, so yeah. It's it very timely. We remember Al fondly. And uh, Jenny, it's good to meet you by Zoom. <laughs> Thank you, David. Yeah, um, it, it, it's just so wonderful to see it. it. It's such beautiful music and just brightens my heart. And I hope there's a resurgence because if there's ever a time when we need good jazz, it's now and good Dixieland. But my dad would be very touched. And um, his last waking, just for you to know, his last waking conscious moments, even though he was in a coma, we were playing uh, um, just a close to walk with V and he took his last, absolute last breath when the, the applause started. Uh, it, it was from at, at Blues Alley. So uh, music is such a bomb and it was always a bomb for him and, uh, and, and a beautiful community. So thank you all. That's, that's beautiful, Jenny. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, you, uh, how about Vic? Do we have Vic yet? He was going to try to make it. Okay. Do we have any other old timers who go back to like the seventies that would like to say hi? No, I probably lost everybody. <laughs> no. it, it, we have it, a good number in there. What's that? We still have a good number of people. Yeah. Okay. Well, any questions from anybody? Yes. Hello? Yes, who's this? This is William Sanders. Um, I saw in that list of uh, past uh, supporters, uh, the name Jalema. Oh, Jalema. 
Oh, uh, Jelema. Jelema, yes. Yeah. I wondered, um, is he, there's a, a Dave Jelema. Yes. A great uh, artist in the traditional uh, style. Right. So Rod Jelema is, is the dad and, and he's a past president of PRJC. Oh, he is. Yeah. And then his son is a terrific cornetist and clarinetist, Dave Jill, David Jelema. Well, uh, perhaps you're aware of uh, the father wrote a great poem dedicated to Rick Spiderbeck. He was he was a poet and he, he, he was. Taught, taught literature at uh, University of Maryland, I think. Oh, really? I didn't I didn't know that. I heard the son play out in Iowa Davenport. Yes. In '99. Yep. And then at sunset, with behind the bandstand and the Mississippi River flowing by, they read that poem. Yeah. It was a very moving moment. Yeah. And yeah, I just Rod, wanted to know if Rod, lived to be, uh, Rod lived to be 90, I think. 90 or 91. Uh, just a, a quick comment. Um, if Vic is on by phone and, and needs to unmute, or, or if anybody on phone needs to unmute, if you put, push star six, it will turn your audio back on. Again, on your, on your phone keypad, star six will unmute you if you're on by phone. Hey, David, this is Audrey. William might be interested in hearing that uh, Dave and Rod Jellema combined to do a concert at uh, that um, church down in DC that j does the jazz concerts. And mm -hmm. Rod read his poems there while Dave put a band together that played behind the poetry. That was pretty neat too. Cool. Very interesting. Oh, I see, I see Rachel there. Hi, Rachel. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> Can't hear you, but I can see you. Yeah, I'm trying to unmute. There we go. <laughs> Hi, I just want to say hello. Thank you so much for doing this. I thought I knew a lot of things about PRJC already, but I learned a ton of things tonight. Yeah. And it's so important that you're doing this. And I thank you so much. I noticed when, um, so I heard about this today from the Facebook page because somehow I accidentally let my PRJC dues expire and I didn't renew. So I renewed for two years today. PRJC hey. membership secretary right there. Okay, <laughs> well, I'm back in. You're, you're going to see my PayPal. I'm paid up for two years. Oh, Rachel great. and David Erickson. David is also on the line. I think he's joining from his basement studio. But um, just really want to thank you for putting this together. It's so fun to see people's names and faces that I haven't heard from in a while and yeah. many great memories. And uh, I'm gonna try to come out to a jam session one of these days. So just wanna great. thank you. That would be great. Thank you, Rachel. For those who don't know, Rachel was the, the pianist in the very first edition of, uh, of the Federal Focus Jazz Band in 1988. And she went on to become the youngest ever president yeah. of the club <laughs> no. uh, a few years later and uh, organized all those trips to the, to the French Quarter Festival and and then and wound up marrying Dave Erickson, who is another alumnus of Capital Focus trumpeter and a wonderful player. So, yeah. Well, maybe. thank you for putting this together, really, on behalf of both of us. Thank you so much. You bet. And uh, and we I saw Jim Tozy on the call. I don't know if he wants to, if he's still there, wants to unmute. He's the man who got Federal Focus started. And. Uh, sponsored the band for many years. Oh yes, I, that was a great time. You know, I always wanted to be a musician when I was in New Orleans and I couldn't do it. So the next thing to do, I could find the best people with kids in Washington. It was just a great ride. Mm -hmm. the credit goes to Dave. Dave has been, been an excellent educator. He spends time with the, the young people. It was, and, I, and when I could see him play, it was just a wonderful thing. And I'm so pleased the institution's still continuing. So I was glad to be part of that. You you were a big part of that, Jim. It wouldn't have happened without you. And and what you put in place changed my life forever. Yeah. <laughs> Truly. Thank you. Well, uh, what do you think, Ellie? Should we wrap up? I, I, I think, I think it's, it's about here. time. It, it was, Dave, just a great presentation. and. I mean, just so much to learn and so fun to see some of those old pictures and, and hear the samples and what, what a great job you did on that. Thank you so much for doing that. And thanks everybody for attending this evening. And um, 
We do a monthly. Oh, cool! Wow. Awesome. We 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 do a monthly jazz talk, and we've, uh, as Dave mentioned, um, had some really great speakers. Next month, we have Chris Tokarski, who's a pianist out of New Orleans, doing the music and professors of Storyville, and so he will be doing some piano playing in addition to to, to talking about some of those. Uh, historical folks from the Storyville district of New Orleans um, and, and all kinds of other things coming up, including Banu's online concert in May. So please keep your eyes on the Facebook page. And uh, you most certainly, uh, if you're not members, please think about joining. You'll get the newsletter every month, which has all the details about the upcoming events. And it's a great way to support musicians. I mean, we're, we're taking any donations, which we take, um, and I'll, I'll send a follow up out about this, but we take donations in toward these programs and that just goes for us to be able to keep hosting events and paying musicians um, who desperately need that right now. You know, there are not a lot of gigs to be had, although things are starting to open up. So, so yeah, please uh, consider joining if you aren't um, members and check out our content online and hopefully we'll be able to see each other again in person really soon. So I, uh... thank you all. Yes. As long as I got three people together in the same room, I'm going uh -oh. to talk. Uh -oh. um, uh, Ellie was mentioning, she's my partner in crime. This is Joel she, Albert speaking, folks. Um, yeah, my name is right here. Um, um, <laughs> Ellie's my partner in crime in a an innovative venture that we're taking for Banu's concert, which originates in New Orleans in a month. Um we have the crazy notion to pull other jazz clubs together. We've never been able to do it. What the pandemic takes away, it also presents opportunity. And live streaming now makes it possible for us to present concerts for our members that come from anywhere. But we took it a step further uh, and we're joining in with other jazz clubs who can help us promote. So we're all going to, we're all going to share in the cost of putting on the concert and we're all going to share in the revenue derived from the concert. There should only be revenue. And uh, it pretends to be a great concert because the New Orleans Jazz Museum has figured out how to get all the technical things necessary to do a um, nice concert together. And it'll be have, we'll have good pictures, we'll have good sound and good talent. It'll be mm -hmm. Banu Gibson and a cast of all stars who just happen to be instructors at the jazz camp that she and others founded in New Orleans. So May 15th, two to three o'clock, put it down. It's going to be on Facebook and YouTube. And I think it's going to be on an ocean liner, like, like in the Caribbean. Don't, don't forget that satellite out in space. And a satellite, right. 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 Uh, it's going to be part of the Space Force. <laughs> It'll be picked up by the Mars lander. There you go. Yes, yes, absolutely. The first right. concert pro pro sent out to, to Mars, right? <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks so much for attending. Have a good evening. And again, we're going to repost this on YouTube. I say we, it's me, and, and I'm slammed right now. So if it's not up today, in the next day or two, I'll get it up onto YouTube. So if there's anything you want to go back and rewatch, it'll be available. Hey, yeah. How are you? Sure. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank yes. you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very, very much. Very well Dave. done, Dave. Stay well. Chris to 50 more yes. years. Yes. Oh, yeah. 50 more. I won't be doing the 100 year retrospective. <laughs> I <don't> know. know. <laughs> so you better summarize it year by year. I'm not sure if I'll be around either, but I might. <laughs> Hi, Judy. <laughs>